to address that problem, we've got to keep our economy competitive, we've got to produce more, be more productive, therefore earn more for ourselves, then we can raise our standard of living despite increases in oil and food prices. The well-being of Singaporeans depends not just on bread and butter issues, but also on our human and social environment, which means on how we behave, how we relate to one another as Singaporeans. How can we make Singapore a more gracious society? We've done many things over the years to improve ourselves. We've got all sorts of campaigns and initiatives. Queue up, be courteous, no spitting, please flush toilets. Most recently, service excellence. Go the extra mile for Singapore. Sometimes people laugh at us. But actually, these are things which we can work on and improve. And if we make people aware of their behaviour and conscious of the impact on others, we can educate them and gradually they can learn new habits and they will respond and our social norms will upgrade. And we have made progress. For us, living in Singapore, seeing one another day by day, we don't notice. For people who come here once in a while and see us at long intervals, it's like a, one of these speeded up movies. They can see the difference. There was a letter in the Straits Times forum page recently which was very interesting and I was very moved reading it. It was a, from a Sri Lankan lady who had visited Singapore 40 years ago when she came here on her way to America to be a postgraduate student. And she came back again recently. Now much older and she needed a wheelchair at the airport. And she spent a few days in Singapore and she was sufficiently moved to write this letter which the Straits Times published. And let me read a little bit of it. From the moment I landed until I left, the city impressed me. Everywhere I met only kindness. I was in a shopping centre and asked a young girl the way to the MRT station. She offered to show me the way and taking my shopping bags led me to the station. Shopkeepers gave me water to drink. People waiting for a bus walked with me to the correct bus stop and people helped me cross the street. I have never experienced this sort of kindness anywhere else in the world. I think she must have been a very nice lady, but the people who behaved so well to her flew the flag for Singapore. We don't know who they are, but we should thank them. We can do even better, of course. We have a Singapore kindness movement, and it conducts surveys of social behaviours that Singaporeans consider important and not important. And they showed me a list of the different things. Quite interesting. Not important, considered not important, doesn't mean really not important. But considered important at least shows me where some of the problems are. So some of the things we are good at is sitting properly at the cinema. Don't put your feet on the chair in front of you. Very difficult for tall people like me. Say thank you after being served. And that people remember. But other things not so good. Say please and not so common. Clear tables and return food trays need to improve. We are trying to inculcate this habit. I don't understand. Every national serviceman knows exactly what to do in his cookhouse. <laughs> Maybe we need more reservist training. But at Suntec City, no reservists, no NS men. It's going to take time to change the mindset. Because the mindset is, I go to the food courts to eat and not to clean tables. So I got a letter recently from somebody, a lady, an email, talking exactly about this, about how we should make Singapore a more happy place to live. And she mentioned this. She said, actually, we should feel quite embarrassed to leave our dirty plates and dirty table for the next diner. In my mum's house, after eating, 
we will clean our clear our plates and clean the table. This is a good habit we should adopt outside the home. Then she went on to add, oh yes, most importantly, no fines. No fines. <laughs> Dishing out fines hurt relationships and no good image for PAP government. <laughs> so I thank her for her good wishes. We shall try and find some way before thinking about fines. One of the ways we have thought about, which Mediacorp thought about, was to hold a contest on Morning Express Class 95 FM. And we have the DJs, famous people, Glenn Ong and the Flying Dutchman who are here tonight. And they invited listeners to send in their videos of the best and the worst Singaporean habits. Tremendous response. So I asked Mediacorp to compile some highlights, good and ugly, to share with you. This is staying on one side of the escalator going up so people can pass you. The, cra the cab stealer. one on a bus, public transport. This one, crossing the road, red man flashing, all over the shop. My grandfather's road. Man. This one gets the gold medal. <laughs> so there you are. I think the filmmaking is outstanding. The conduct can be improved. I think the best way to focus our efforts is when there's a major event and we are put to the test. And we've done well before the International Olympic Council meeting in 2005, the IMF and World Bank meetings in 2006. And we, we, we put on a really good show, not just to impress people, but because that's the way we want to be. And now we have to prepare for other major events, F1 next month, APEC next year, Youth Olympic Games in 2010. Let's use these opportunities to improve our social graces. This is how other countries have done it. The Olympic Games, Sydney, 2000, it set a very high benchmark. The show was very good, but what really impressed visitors was the genuine warmth and the sincerity of the Australians. There were 47,000 volunteers. They cheered, they drove buses, they manned checkpoints, they greeted big visitors. They were friendly, effective, polite. You say, good day, mate. And after a while, you know what that means, and you feel welcome. Created a whole atmosphere of friendliness and hospitality. China is now hosting the Olympic Games. They've made a huge effort to welcome the athletes and the visitors. And you watch the opening ceremony, and that's spectacular. But what you may not have noticed that they had launched large-scale civility campaigns to educate people. And they designated special days of the month for special movements. So the 11th of the month is queuing up day. Because 11, 1, 1. <laughs> the 22nd of every month is give your way to others, give your seat to others day. Rang wei ri. Because 22 looks like two chairs side by side. 
For the games, they mobilized 100,000 volunteers, mostly young men and women, university students, others, and tremendous pride in their country. And every willingness to go the extra mile, impressing the visitors. That here is a people who are proud of their country and who want to make visitors feel welcome. So we too should mobilize ourselves for the YOG. It's the first time ever the games are being held, so let's make a special effort to make sure that it is an outstanding YOG. We mobilized very successfully to support the bid when Teo Selak went around. He's not here, he's in Beijing tonight. And Singaporeans from all walks of life spontaneously organized themselves to participate. Schools, youth groups, companies, taxi drivers, and I think this grassroots participation impressed the IOC, and so we won the bid. So let us rally together again, show what Singapore is about, and welcome the world with our spirit and our warmth. But we mustn't just stop at the YOG. We've got to work consistently at this, patiently over many years, strive for higher standards and a permanent improvement in our behavior, not for other people, for ourselves so that we can be proud of ourselves and to make Singapore a better place for all of us. I've just got a, an update on the game, Singapore's, <laughs> Singapore 0, China 2. The game is still progressing. We are creating a better Singapore for future generations to enjoy. So my next topic is babies. This is a very long story, so I've prepared a special slide which captures the story. This is a slide which shows our total fertility rate, TFR, which means the average number of children born per woman over her lifetime. And this shows a TFR from 1960 all the way to right now, 2007, last year, coming down like this. And this single slide tells us about our history, about our economy, about our culture, and about our policies. Now let me show you. The history is this graph. From six children per woman in 1960, coming down to the mid-70s to 2.1, which is a replacement level, because you need about two children per woman to replace herself and her husband and then continuing to go down to this 1.3 today. It's the same story which we see in Korea, in Taiwan, in China, all over Asia, as the economy developed, as we educated our people, as women got jobs, and they were liberated. They stopped just having one baby after another at home, and the numbers came down. So that's our history. But if you zoom in in the last 30 years, you will see more interesting detail, starting with the way our economy is. Because actually people have control over when they want their kids. So when the economy goes down, and times are uncertain, and people worry about their, where they're going to get their next meal, they put off having children. So you look at the graph coming down, but the times when it comes down sharply, like here in the mid 90s 80s, it's usually because the economy is not doing well. There was a recession in 1985, which was quite a problem. In the late 90s, it's gone down again, and that was the Asian crisis. And then if you look down here, it comes down again, 9-11 and SARS. So each time there's a crisis, people put off having babies. Crisis passes, numbers bounce back up but never quite go back to where it used to be. But you can see something else very interesting in this graph. Look at the peaks rather than the low points. Take this one, 1976. Why is that? You take this one, another peak, 1988. <laughs> then you look at the next one, 2000. Dragon years. But each dragon, smaller than the next dragon, 
So 2012, I worry for the little dragon. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> you can also see our policies in this chart. Family policies. In the 1960s, the policy was two is enough. Fabulously successful, in fact, over successful. We had a poster, you remember this, girl or boy, two is enough, two little girls. We achieved the target, we over-fulfilled our plan. Went down, in the late 80s, we had to change our message. Three of you can afford it. So this was after the dip here, we got alarm, we changed. Say three kids. And it worked. There was some effect. Quite successful, went up, the dragon helped. But it stayed up for quite long. And then, unfortunately, it came down again. And then we decided we needed some more policies, so we had baby bonus in 2001, and child development co-saving scheme. That's the proper name, but actually we call him baby bonus. And that, unfortunately, didn't work because we were hit by 9-11 and SARS. And come here, 2004, this is my little contribution my first rally, marriage and procreation package. You see, we've given up having a lot of pictures, just one little infant. <laughs> and if you study the graph very carefully, you can see that, in fact, there was some improvement. Just a little bit. But you really can't see it very well. We need a magnifying glass. <laughs> so if we zoom in with a magnifying glass, 2004, 1.26, 2007, 1.29. So, improvement. But the target is 2.1. So, 1.5 is here, 2.1 is here. <laughs> we will have a problem. So, the question is, what more should we do?